Okay. So I think we are live now. Um, so welcome everyone to the first edition of the Deep Learning 101 sessions. Uh, uh, so to begin with, uh, I would like to, first of all, thank you for joining our event. Um, we are Deep Learning Sessions Portugal, a group of volunteers dedicated to share insights on deep learning inside and outside of Portugal. Um, and as I said, today we have our first edition of the 101 uh, sessions where we intend to give a primer or an overview uh, into several applications that recently benefited from this boom on deep learning. Um, we will have in total three of these sessions and today we have our first one on speech. So to tell us a bit more about this fascinating field, we have with us Katarina Butel and Alberto Abad. And so I'll present you uh, pre present them briefly. So Katarina holds a master's degree in biomedical engineering from IST and is currently pursuing her PhD on the same institution on speech and as a biomarker for speech speech as a biomarker for speech affecting diseases. Her remarkable work has not only earned her recognition from the University of Lisbon with several awards, but has also led to a visiting research position at the Cognitive Systems Lab at the University of Bremen as well as an internship at Google AI in Toronto. And we will have Katerina uh, sharing more details about her research later. Uh, and we also have with us uh, the pleasure of having Alberto Abad, an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering of IST, and a researcher at, at INESC. Alberto earned his telecommunication engineering and his PhD degrees from the Technical University of Catalonia. Uh, and with over two decades of experience in human language technologies, his research interests cover robust speech recognition, speaker and language characterization, applied machine learning, healthcare applications, and privacy preserving speech processing and machine learning. So please join me in welcoming Katarina and Alberto. And without further ado, Alberto and Katarina, the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And hi, everyone. Uh, I will start myself. Okay. Uh, as uh, thanks for the introduction. Actually, uh, you're right. I've been 20 years working on this topic, and and essentially, like 10 years ago, things started to move. Okay. Essentially, deep learning arrived. And what I want to do today first is to show you how deep learning impact or or field. Okay. It will be a very superficial overview but i hope I, I, you can you can find it interesting and then katarina will uh, introduce the most fascinating actually part of this uh, uh, presentation that is her work okay and but let me just start with introducing you the real guest or star of today's session that it's uh, if i can pass the slide is the speech signal okay and and, and essentially just to be sure that we are in, on the same page the speech signal is produced when we obviously speak. It's a it's a waveform that propagates typically through air, and then we can capture with a microphone, typically with a microphone, right? And the microphone converts the signal in a electrical signal, and in order to have it stored in our computer and to be able to to do things with that signal or to listen to it, uh, we basically sample the signal. And essentially, what the signal becomes or turns out in our computer it's a continuous uh, sequence of values that you can see here plot on the top okay and typically you have depending on the sampling frequency like 16,000 values per second so essentially here we have like three four five seconds we probably have here 80,000 different values this is our, our our main guest okay and as you can see there is not a lot of a structure there essentially if I say the same thing that is said here even the same person probably will look different. So it's quite noisy, as you can notice. But if you if we look closer, essentially you can start to see some patterns. For instance, in some regions, we can see some certain uh, well, periodicities. And this, uh, this is essentially because of we are producing uh, voice sounds that are produced with vowel, uh, vowel falls. And these noisy one parts are essentially on voice sounds. The important thing here is that we don't really use a lot of this representation. Um, in practice, speech scientists, way, what we do is to look to the uh, time frequency representation, which basically means to look what is the contributions of each frequency, especially in these regions that are semi-periodic. Okay? And this is a much nicer way of, of trying to analyze the signal. 
And if you ever heard of a spectrogram, this is exactly what we have here. Okay. I, I well, but the actually the, the, the part that is actually interesting, in my in my opinion, that the part that uh, catches me to, to to work in this field is that speech uh, is a carrier of a lot of information. Of course, we have the message, the text, the, the what we want to say, and we typically call this the linguistic content. But we can somehow modify this linguistic information, maybe with our intonation, to to mean something that's slightly different. We call this typically paralinguistic, but very specially, what we have is a lot of extralinguistic information. Basically, in speech signal, there's information about the speaker who speaks, his language, his accent, Spanish, my one, uh, my state, if I'm happy, if I'm sad. Even in some cases, if I have some kind of disease that affects the way I speak, this can be encoded on my, on my speech signal. And obviously, obviously, this has attracted many speech researchers in the past. This is not a new field that have tried to think or have dream of uh, trying to extract all this information autom automatically. Okay, And for many reasons, first, because we can try to imitate humans and have something like, I don't know, a conversational system that can solve problems for us, like Alexa, we can ask to play a new music, or even we can have superhuman abilities. Essentially, we can have data mining to crawl a huge amounts of data that would, we would never be, we, we could never do, do if, if uh, if, if it had to be done by, by human. And the way of extracting this information it has passed for several approximations and improvements and so on, but of course, nowadays, we can do this and we do this combining machine learning and speech processing, right? But in fact, we can do it more or less because there are some specific challenges of speech machine learning that are worth uh, to, to mention. The first thing, as you saw in that signal that I introduced at the beginning, um, the, thing, the audio has a lot of variability. If I say the same thing twice, it will change. If it's said by myself or by Katerina, it will change. Be not because we are different persons, we have a different gender or accent or state. All of this makes that signal very variable and essentially affects the classes that we want to detect. Essentially, if we want to do ASR, it will be different, uh, the ASR system or, or the, the approximation we have to do. There are other sources of variability. For instance, since it's a, it's a waveform that propagates through air, the noise, the environmental noise, or the echo reverberation of the room will affect the, the quality of the signal. Of course, the microphone. If I use a cheap microphone, my signal will, will, will be worse. Secondly, and this is shared with many other tasks probably, we have data collection and annotation challenge. For instance, there is not a lot of data of speech that is annotated. It's quite hard to find annotated data for speech. And, and there is something that is also share with other tasks, there is quite a domain dependence. For instance, if I want to develop a system to classify information on red speech, the characteristics of red speech is very diff different of a spontaneous speech. And typically the system that they will learn and train on top of uh, red speech will fail uh, to process um, automatic speech. Sorry, uh, uh, spontaneous speech. In addition to, to the data problems, I want to mention the, those problems that are that make this problem particularly interesting from the machine learning perspective. And this is related with the, the nature of the input and the output. As I said, the input, it's a continuous signal. So there are no discretized tokens as we can have in similar tasks like uh, text related to NLP. We don't have uh, a, a, a fixed amount of... No, no, puedes, no puedes, esto, esto me una presentación. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, um, so basically, we, we don't have a, fi a finite set of tokens, um, and, 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 and this makes the problem more difficult, right? Uh, the other thing that I mentioned at the beginning, the, the length of the signal is very long compared typically to the problem we want to classify. If we have a long signal and we want to classify gender, it's a sequence to one problem. But the sequence is very long. But the most difficult problem is if we have a sequence of, of audio of speech and we want to for instance recognize the words that are there this is a sequence to sequence problem and the worst thing is that we don't know where it sound starts and ends we don't know when it, where each word starts and ends and this makes the things complicated of course i can say things faster and slower and we can uh, have other uh, related problems with that uh in spite of the challenge that we have been developing systems for for speech uh, for speech machine learning and we have very successful uh, cases and examples that are, are out there in the in, in, in industry and in several applications uh, 
the speech recognition, speaker recognition, speech synthesis, speech enhancement. Uh, I have others here, speech and language identification, and so on. But uh, and all of them have the, their own particularities. But essentially, um, the, the 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 thing that is important here to notice is that somehow speech recognition has been the king application or the most important application in, in speech processing. And as such, there is a lot of people working on this over the years and everything that kind of worked well for speech recognition applies to all other all the other tasks. So considering that, what I will do for the rest of the presentation is, is to focus on speech recognition and I will try to focus speci specifically on what uh, how deep learning affected um, the research and the development of systems uh, in speech recognition. So let's go with ASR. We call this ASR. Uh, some people call this speech to text, but usually researchers, speech researchers, we call this ASR. And um, this this is not a, a new problem. It's not a new topic. We we have been dream since the fifties to be able to talk to a computer. But essentially, we had and we had had several generations of development. But um, we have had essentially two huge breakthroughs. The first one happened already in the 80s that was essentially recognizing the problem as a, a statistical problem. So basically doing ASR, converting audio into test, is finding the most likely sequence of words that match a specific in, uh, input. And we do this using a framework that is called hidden Markov models. Uh, that was a super popular framework and the way of solving ASR until quite recently, until 2010. That is when deep learning was introduced. So just to show you how, how these things work in the past before deep learning, essentially here we have the, the, the metric that we use for uh, automatic speech recognition is called word error rate, which is the number of words we fail in a sentence over the total number of, of words in that sentence, in that reference. And for instance, here we have different tasks. This is conversational telephone speech. And we see, and this is a trend that happened always with this task. Whenever it was released at the, at the beginning, we were very bad solving these problems. And then we started to learn the problem, to crack it somehow. At some point, we reached a subtle point. Okay, And this happened for everything, for conversational telephone speech, broadcast speech, uh, meeting, meeting speech, and so on. And essentially, if we look to the switchboard task, somehow around 2000, 2002, we were not able to improve anymore. And Essentially, we abandoned this task because we couldn't improve it. Okay, and only at 2012, someone in in a space of very of only two years reduced the error to the half, and in a couple of additional years, we reached performance performance that it's considered impaired with human performance. And what happened here, as you can imagine by the name of the sessions, is deep learning. Okay, essentially, deep learning impacted this field. So. Just to, to, to let you know exactly how this uh, what this happened, I, I need to introduce the two main approaches to solve this problem of ASR. We have an old one, the conventional, traditional one, what we, we call hierarchical modeling of speech. In that case, what we do is, as good research, as good engineers, is to split a difficult problem in very small pieces of, of problems, small pieces of different problems, okay? And this has been the, the, the state of the art until 2012, more or less, and it's still relevant in certain conditions. This was impacted by deep learning. I will show you how. In addition to that, there was a new generation of systems that were pure deep learning that we'll introduce to you also, that we call end-to-end -end systems. So let's go for the first success case in ASR uh, of the users of this deep learning. As I said, we have this problem, an audio, uh, continuous audio, and we want to recognize what has been said there. And as I mentioned, what we do is first we do feature extraction. Typically, we have a feature vector for every 10 milliseconds. And then we say, OK, how do we relate this audio, this observation, to my basic recognition units? And best systems use as basic recognition units phonemes, OK? Kind of phonemes. Um, and the idea here is quite simple. I will use a statistical model, a different one for each one of my phonemes. I will collect a lot of A's, B's, C's. I have a statistical model of that. This is what we call the acoustic model. This is like uh, uh, the backbone or any uh, old fashioned, if you can call, you want to call this way, ASR system. Then, once we have these acoustic units, we need to relate it with words. And that's quite simple. What we can have is just a list 
with words and the corresponding transcription. And this is a kind of a dictionary. It can be simply a list. Okay. We call this pronunciation model. And once we have a way to relate observations with phonemes and with words, the only thing we need to recognize sentences is a way that says which is the most likely word that might happen now after the previous ones. And this is exactly what a language model does. Okay. These three models combined together, trained separately, for the language model, we only use text. For the pronunciation model, we typically use knowledge, human knowledge. And for the acoustic model, we use parallel audio and text data. We train these models. We build a quite complex decoding system that finds the most likely sequence of words. Okay. Uh, obviously, with with uh, with the impact of this learning, all these module, modules have changed. But I will focus in the acoustic model one. So how Deep learning change this acoustic model one. In this hierarchical approach, the basic model that we use, as I mentioned before, is the hidden Markov model. The hidden Markov model helps us to model the progression of time of speech. This is the, this this uh, arrows here, and each one of these states that is kind of modeling the phoneme itself. In the past, we use a Gaussian mixture model. Okay, it's a kind of a generative model. Well. Many years ago, already in the 90s, some groups, including our group, tried to use MLPs to replace these Gaussian mixture models as a way of modeling each phoneme. And in fact, this kind of work, but was behind, remember, lower is better, was behind the conventional systems based on G GMM. What happened in 2012? What changed here? Essentially, instead of using vanilla MLPs with a couple of layers, people started to try with new DNNs with seven, eight, nine layers, with all these new things that were starting to appear, like new regularization, regularization strategies and new uh, activation strategies and so on. So basically, we, we could train deeper networks. We could also train wider networks. That means not only um, modeling phonemes, but also what we call phonemes that depend on what they have on the right and, and on the left. So we had more outputs, not only 40, 50 outputs, but probably 3,000 or 4,000 outputs in my, our network. And of course, we have GPUs, no? and we had computers that could that allow us to train these models. And by doing this trick, so keeping, the, let me go back again, all the architecture is essentially the same, but replacing, and even the HMM, we have the HMM, but we replace how we model the observations. We use a DNN. What happened in 2012? is that we move from the saddle point where we had like 28% error to 80% error. So we have been like 15 years not moving almost a one error point. And in one year, introducing the DNS, we reduce like uh, 10 points. And that was, of course, a, a, a bomb. You know? Essentially, it changed everything. Because uh, immediately after any new version of a new deep learning model was appearing, we were trying as an acoustic model uh, for our old-fashioned ESR system. And of course, what we could observe is it's an enormous reduction of errors as long as we were trying new things like TDNNs, that is a kind of time delay network, it's a kind of DNN and CNN uh, together, LSTMs, and so on. So this is the first huge impact that the, uh, deep learning had in ESR. Still, speech researchers were not happy enough. Why? because this model was quite complicated. We still need a language model. We need to ask linguistics to have this list of words with a transcription. We need to find a very complex strategies for decoding. We can propagate errors because we train everything separately. And more importantly, which is quite annoying, is, oh, this is passing uh, along. Uh, uh, more importantly, in order to train our DNN, we need to know which, is, which phoneme happens in, any, in, in every small piece of audio. In every 10 milliseconds, we need an alignment. Okay. And there is no, uh, there was not an easy way to solve this with deep learning. And we had to use old fashioned systems for that. Essentially, we had to train an old fashioned system uh, first and then to train a DNN. And nobody wants to have twice the work if you can avoid it. And here's where this, uh, the second uh, deep learning success in ASR comes. What researchers thought it's okay. Now that deep learning is improving, why we do, do we need all this complication? Just let's try just to probably, maybe even we don't need this, but probably just use feature extraction based on, on knowledge, use these uh, spectrograms. 
and and then have a single DNN that that produces characters or words depending on the input. And in order to solve this, to, to make this possible, the, the difficult problem is that we don't know where each character starts and ends corresponding to the, to the input signal, to the speed signal. And we need a, a way to solve this. Okay. And this, nowadays, there are essentially two ways of solving this, and an oldest one and a more recent one. Uh, the oldest one is what we call CTC, this, this connection connection is temporal classification that basically proposes a very clever way, basic on dynamic programming, of doing computing the probability of all possible alignments between the input and the reference. And once you have this probability, you will propagate. You compute the loss and will propagate through the network. Um, and this uses, as I said, uh, dynamic programming. The second way that is currently the most successful one, and probably you are more familiar. Sorry, this is passing along. I don't know how I stop this. Uh, well, I will try to be fast. Um, uh, the, the, most, the second way of doing that is using sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence attention based encoder-decoder architectures, something that probably you are quite uh, more used to, the, to the, the many things I mentioned, because basically this is the backbone of the basis of very famous transformers, okay? And, and both of them work quite well. What, both of them have some limitations. For instance, uh, these encoder-decoder architectures, somehow you might need to have the input signal to, 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 um, to compute the attention, the attention scores, the attention matrix. That means that it doesn't work very well uh, if we want to do a stream, a streaming ASR. But still, as you can imagine, all, all the, the improvements that came uh, from the different fields of machine learning, including NLP, it started to impact on these encoder-decoder uh, uh, architectures. And uh, once it, the transformer was proposed, immediately, the same year or the, one, or the year after, it was proposed this, this speech transformer. That essentially, it's also a transformer. We had the encoder, the decoder, the, we have the self-attention, we have everything the same, but somehow it can change a bit the, the details of how we process the input. And there are some modifications on top of the transform of the trans this transformer to adapt to the particularities of a speech. For instance, we have the conformer that is a very uh, very popular architecture that basically replaces the tra um, the transformer encoder block by the conformer block that has some convolutions uh, there in, in in the middle that somehow obtains more local information about the speech and is useful for the speech. But essentially, this these are transformers fully supervised. I, I don't want to forget to mention one very famous sample of this kind of architectures of or this kind of systems that is the um, OpenAI Whisper system. Essentially, the, the Whisper system is a speech transformer with some additional things. It's multitask, but but it's kind of vanilla transformer. Uh, what it makes it very particularly or very special is that the fact, the fact that it has been trained with three three hundred sixty thousand hours of uh, label data, which is insane. Uh, the, Best systems we had in the past was were trained like with 1,000 hours or something like that. Okay. Then, uh, in addition to use transformers in a supervised way with the encoder and decoder architecture, we also have a new trend following very much what is happening in the, in the field of text with GPT, that is to train self supervised representations of a speech. And we it's, it's, there is some kind of of there is only transformer encoders, right? And there is a definition of, of some sort of pretext pretext task that allows us training uh, this kind of encoder of a speech of general model of a speech that can later be used as features or as an upstream model to to make fine tuning to a downstream task the same way that happens with with uh, current GPT um, encoders okay or transformer encoders for text and, and here of course we have. This, uh, all these Meta and Google trying to do uh, the biggest models, uh, the best performing ones, the ones that are multitask, the ones that are multilingual, and so on. Essentially, with this new second success story of deep learning, we reduce, in that case, read the speech task, the, the, the world rate from five to one in like, like five years only. Okay. But of course, there are more challenges in tasks. Okay. There are others that consider noise, that consider uh, other kinds of, of, of speech, and here there are still challenges. We have not solved all the problems, but obviously uh, deep learning is helping a lot in, in reducing the, the, the water rate in all of these tasks. But as I mentioned, this is still a, um, um, an open problem. 
for instance, uh, if we want to recognize uh, the speech of someone that has accent, or we want to recognize uh, from from a low uh, low resource language, or even for children, we may have problems with uh, with current systems, and we need still to advance the state of the art in these fields. Uh, and now, just I wanted to pass to Katarina. Just uh, I wanted to mention that in spite of all of this challenge. Uh, uh, these technologies, these core technologies, not only speech recognition, but also TTS and so on, they, they are becoming obviously very mature and allows us to try to uh, make links with other with other fields. And there are many fields of application where we can use this technology. And one of one of them that it's uh, very dear to me is the the health field. And, and Katerina will talk a bit more about this. Hi. Uh, okay, so I'll continue with with the health part. So as Alberto was saying, uh, speech has been has the potential to be used for health applications. Namely, it can be used as a biomarker for the detection of diseases. Um, and many works have proposed to use speech for different disorders, not only for speech and language disorders, which is the most obvious, but also for psychiatric disorders like bipolar disease or depression also for respiratory disorders or neurodegenerative disorders. And the reason why we are able to use speech as a biomarker for these diseases is the fact that speech production is actually a quite complex process and that it starts in the brain. So it involves the nervous system, the brain and the nerves that conduct the neural information, also the respiratory system, also the articulators and the muscles um, and the muscular system. And this means that if there's a malfunctioning on any of the systems, it will leave specific cues in the speech signal that we can detect and analyze. So this is more or less the standard pipeline to use speech uh, as a biomarker for the detection of diseases. We start with audio data uh, and we need data from healthy controls and data from patients. Uh, typically, we have rather small data sets for, for this kind of task. Um, and the type of speech data that we have can be very different. So it can be spontaneous speech, for example, a conversation between a patient and a medical doctor. It can also have uh, certain tasks like um, saying a vowel for a very long time or reading a text or describing an image. So uh, some variability. And we have a pre-processing step. Um, we also have a feature extraction step or we just, as Alberto was saying, we need to convert this varying length sequence to a numerical representation. We can do some feature transformation or feature selection, uh, and then we perform the classification. Because um, it is frequent that data sets are small, um, it is more um, frequent also to use more classic machine learning methods for this classification or regression tasks like support vector machines. So the deep learning part uh, that we get in, in this type of task usually happens more at the pre-processing stage or at the feature extraction stage. So in pre-processing, one first thing that we could do is doing automatic speech recognition. This is this that Alberto has been talking um, about since the beginning. So because for some diseases, it is also important the linguistic content of what we're saying. For example, if you think about depression or about dementia, it is important to get this linguistic content. And so we first run automatic speech recognition. Um, it can be also useful to do voice activity detection. For example, if you have some spontaneous speech, you need to isolate the speech sounds from the silences or from background music or something. It can also be important to do diarization So diarization is this task that you ask who speaks when. Um, and this is relevant. Imagine if we have a recording of a medical appointment. We need to isolate the speech of the medical doctor from the speech of the patient such that we can analyze only the patient. And so this itself is also a problem called the diarization. And here we have some tools that use some neural networks as part of their pipelines. Uh, and you can follow the links if you want to know more. As for feature extraction, Typically, we start with knowledge-based features, and this can be acoustic or linguistic. And I will talk most more about the acoustic because this is more about speech. Although, as I was saying, the linguistic content is also very relevant. These features can be temporal or uh, spectral features. 
And usually we derive them using some signal processing techniques, but some of them can also be derived using um, neural network based approaches. For example, we have here the voice onset time, which basically is the time. So when we're producing voice sounds, as Alberto was saying, the vocal folds need to start vibrating. And so this transition from the non-vibrating uh, sta uh, states to a vibrating state, and this time we call it the voice onset time, and it gives information about, for example, um, can measure, measure the agility of the, of the vocal tract. And for example, there's one work that detects these with convolutional neural networks. We also have intelligibility measures. This can be manually annotated by, by human experts, but it can also be uh, derived using neural networks um, to get an automatic assessment. For example, for coherence, we can use sentence embeddings and cosine similarity, or for perplexity, we can use um, language models. So a lot of uh, options. Besides knowledge-based features, we also um, have deep learning representations, so more abstract numeric representations that we can extract from deep neural networks. And here for speech, I will uh, talk about speaker embeddings and the base embeddings. So starting with speaker embeddings, the idea here is to leverage a network trained for speaker identification. So this means that we get an input wave um, sounds, and then we'll get a final probability of the speaker. And we have here a lot of layers. And towards the last layers, we can extract these numeric representations that encode information about the identity of the speaker. But we hypothesize it also includes information about the health state of the speaker. OK, so besides this, we can also use base embeddings, for example. Um, these are self-supervised. Uh, and it's a self-supervised encoder-decoder architecture. So we also have the wave signal as the input, but then um, we'll have different uh, workers at the top. So we'll be trying to solve different tasks at the same time. One of the tasks is to reconstruct the waves, the original wave signals, and the other tasks will be just to get some of the features. Um, this is PACE stands for Problem Agnostic Speech Encoder. This means that because it's trying to solve so many tasks at the same time, the idea is that these embeddings will encode relevant information for many, many problems. And so we, we hypothesize this are also good for disease detection. Okay, so we covered more or less the, the pipeline, and, and this is getting quite good results uh, in performing disease detection from speech. But there are some challenges that, the face, um, that the, this field is facing which are mostly concerned with the limitations of the current data sets. So data sets are typically small. They uh, are recorded under very specific recording conditions. They include only one language, only one disease. So this raises some problems uh, which guides the research that we're doing. And some of these problems are, how can we deal with data scarcity? Can other modalities complement the speech signal? Can we monitor the disease progression through time or even make predictions into the future? Can we provide uh, interpretable reasoning that's actually useful for the medical community? So are these results general, generalizable to different data sets, um, even though they are recorded in the different conditions with different speech tasks? So we'll start by covering the first two. Um, and actually start, start with the first. So how can we deal with data scarcity? First of all, why is it difficult to acquire? Why, is, uh, why are data difficult to acquire? Um, of course, time and monetary constraints. So we need the data to be annotated by medical professionals, and that's, of course, expensive and time consuming. And also clinical trials are very um, expensive. And then we have the other side of ethics and privacy um, and privacy preserving um, regulations, which will limits the type of data that we can collect and also limits the data sharing between different research groups. And, and that's a big problem. Just to show you an example, these are some of the data sets that we work with for disease detection. Um, and the good news is, so it's good that they exist, that they are either publicly available or made available for some challenge. And this allows us to get some benchmarks. But on the other hand, because they are so small, it's also a challenge. And there are very, for example, here we have some data sets with five hours or four hours, and this is much smaller than what's used for other speech tasks. Um, 
So how can we deal with data scarcity? Of course, go and collect more data, but because we're not going to discuss that today, um, let's talk about some machine learning based strategies. So one idea is to do data augmentation, and that's ma there's many ideas for this. So you can just simply introduce copies of the same data with some perturbations like background noise or babble or music. You can also synthesize new data using GANs. Um, Another idea is to use intelligent labeling paradigms. So for example, semi-supervised learning, active learning, cooperative learning, these are all strategies that will leverage a smaller label data set to annotate a larger um, data set with minimal human uh, involvement. And another idea is to use transfer learning. So here the idea is to train a network in a task for which we have a lot of data and learn a very good and meaningful representation and then leverage this representation in another domain where we have little data. And so this is exactly what we did in one of our works for COVID detection. So everyone remembers COVID, no introductions needed here. Um, and the speech community created these data sets and made a challenge to encourage uh, creating screening tests to detect the presence of COVID from coughs. From coughs. Um, and so we had this data. And you can see it's quite small. Um, and we detected some problems with some of the files that identified some biases that I'm not going to get into detail, but our data set got even smaller um, with very few examples of positive cases. So our idea was let's just go and use transfer learning. So here uh, we had this small corpus, but at the same time, we had a corpus available collected in Lausanne that had around 15,000 cough samples. Some of them had annotations for COVID that they were self-reported, and a small number of them had some annotations by pneumologists. So we leveraged this for our pipeline. Um, we started with some pre-processing and extracting uh, some features, and then we pass, we used these uh, transfer learning ideas where we trained three different feature extractures. Uh, so the TDNNF, the CNN embeddings, and uh, Pace Plus features. So, okay, TDNNF embeddings. These are a very simple, uh, similar architecture to the X vectors that I was describing in the beginning. But here, what we did was we trained this uh, network for age um, regression and gender classification for which we had more data available. And then we also trained it to do some classification of the annotations that we had from the pneumologists regarding the type of cough, the presence of uh, dyspnea, the severity of the, the cough. And so we think that these uh, representations that we get from here encode meaningful knowledge to then predict COVID. We also use TNN embeddings. So this was from um, VGG um, model. That's basically a big convolutional neural network that was pre-trained on 5 million hours of YouTube data for audio classification. So it's not exactly the same task, but a lot of data was available. And then we fine tune it on the COVID. Um, and also we use the PACE plus embeddings that I was describing before. And we use this version trained just on speech and also trained on coughs. And I can show you here the results. So for the embeddings alone, these PACE embeddings uh, were the best uh, results. And then on the test set, when we fused all three embeddings, we got 69.3%. Of course, this is not enough to get a tool uh, to deploy to get some screening of COVID, but it, it shows the potential of using transfer learning when we have very small data available. OK, so we discussed some machine learning based strategies to deal with data scarcity. There's also other ideas like alternative data collection strategies, for example, crowdsourcing, which was also very important during the COVID times. Um, and also another idea is mine already existing um, repositories of data in the wild. And this is exactly what we did in one of our works. So we had this idea of just going to YouTube and query for vlogs where people claim that they are suffering from a disease. And this gets our patients. And then we go again and query for vlogs of unrelated topics like book reviews, and this gives us our controls. And then we um, annotated this with Amazon trackers, and this got us uh, data sets with uh, one, around 130 hours, which is a lot, already a lot larger than the four hour data sets that we were working with before. Of course, this data can be very noisy, right? This is not medically verified, but it was our hypothesis that the self-reported health status would be a proxy 
for the true health status. So we did some experiments and compared training with controlled conditions uh, and in the wild data. And these are the results for depression. But I want to show you is this. So here we trained with data in the wild and tested with controlled conditions. And still we were able to obtain 78.78% 78 and weighted average recall. So this is higher is better. So it's still uh, pretty good. Okay, we discussed data scarcity. Um, another question is, can other modalities complement the speech signal? Um, and here we explored obstructive sleep apnea. So it's a, um, breathing, a breathing disorder that's associated with sleep. So people will stop breathing several times per hour during the night. And this is associated with higher risk of diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and, and all that. Um, and it is characterized by some anatomical alterations and altered muscle tone of the um, and pharyngeal wall properties. So this means we expect to have some uh, some anomalies in speech, but also some anomalies in the structure of the face, and that's why it's a good candidate for multimodal analysis. So we did the same thing. We went on YouTube, get some data. This time we have a pilot corpus, so it's smaller. We didn't go through the Amazon Turkish annotation. We get a bunch of videos, we extract the audio, and we do our pipeline with the speech activity detection, extracting features with the X vectors, the pace, and the knowledge base that we've already discussed, and then we perform the classification. But because we had videos, we also extracted some, fra some frames with the facial images, and we also extracted um, embeddings for lip reading. So lip reading, yeah, that, that's maybe a bit surprising. So lip reading is sometimes used to enhance the performance of ASR systems. So it makes sense intuitively, right? So if you are trying to understand what someone is saying and we cannot really hear very well. If, if we can read the lips, then it gives us some help. So it's very useful for that. But we hypothesize these lip reading embeddings would also contain information about the breathing patterns, the articulation, and this could help us um, detect obstructive sleep apnea. And so here are the results. So the speech alone just gives us a majority vote accuracy of 67.5%, uh, so higher is better. But fusing all the modalities, we reach 82%. Okay, so we discussed these two questions, but there are many others. For example, I was discussing, I was um, saying in the beginning, uh, it would be interesting to monitor disease progression through time. It would be interesting to make predictions into the future, such that people could adhere to different treatments or change their lifestyle. It's also important to get interpretable. Um, reasoning and models to be help, useful for the medical community and also discuss if these results are actually journalizable since that we're doing um, tests with very small data. And we'll not have time to discuss all of this today, but I leave here some pointers for uh, works that are already discussing this. Um, and I leave here even more points. For example, we should try to discuss some cross-lingual solutions. For example, can we get some references that are specific for each person? And how can we do with the comorbidities? Um, so this is all food for thought that I will leave here open. And with this, we conclude this part on the detection of diseases from speech. But because this is Deep Learning 101, we thought it would be interesting to, to leave here some pointers on how to get started if you want to get your hands on speech and deep learning. So here are some tools and libraries that we use. Let's start with feature extraction. So we have, for example, Librosa. Um, we have Parcel Mouth. We have Open Smile and Torch Audio. So we we'll have uh, Python compatible or PyTorch compatible. Uh, Torch Audio is mostly for data sets and input and output, but it's uh, very useful. We also have some uh, pointers for models, of course, Hugging Face. Um, but also Sperl, SpeechBrain, SPNet, and Caldi. So all these tools are, are very useful to find pre-trained models already and full pipelines to, to build entire systems. Okay, um, so today we've discussed, Alberto has uh, presented um, an introduction to speech and machine learning, what are the challenges, he talks about automatic speech recognitions, how the field has evolved since the beginning, uh, with the brilliant successes of deep learning, but also the fact that the problem is not solved yet and there's still um, a lot of room to improve with low resource languages or atypical speech, uh, for example. We've also discussed 
Uh, how can we use speech for automatic disease detection? We covered some of the challenges of this area, and also um, we gave some pointers for tools and libraries on where to get started. And just before we finish, another place that you can get started is with us. So we work at the Human Language Technologies Lab at Ines KID. Um, we, or one of the highlights of the group, uh, is to build bridges between speech research and many other areas like health, as I was discussing now, or privacy, or uh, language learning, geographical information retrieval, law, cyberbullying, uh, many different things. Right now, we have two major research projects, Accelerate AI and Center for Responsible AI, and we are hiring. So yeah, uh, maybe reach out if you're interested. This is a photo, a recent photo of the group. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll better you again. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the great presentation. Um, yeah, it's quite a astonishing that you can extract so much information about a person just based on speech. <laughs> um, and now I think we can go through the questions we have. Uh, we have one question in the chat, and meanwhile, uh, people, if you want to add some questions there, feel free to. We have a question from Carolina Flip, which asks that, which asks for which types of data augmentations are typically used. Uh, so I'm wondering, the question might be towards, uh, I, I guess it's like uh, everyone is acquainted with the data augmentations that you use for images, where you crop, you turn, blah, blah, you had some noise. But uh, how does this apply to speech, I guess? Yes, for myself. Sure. So um, we have a bunch of them also. And uh, the, the typical ones we use for ASR, uh, but also in other tasks, is um, gain uh, or gain perturbation. So essentially, we, we apply different gains to the signals. We use also speed perturbation. In the case of the speech, we, we, we play or we record the signal slightly slower or slightly uh, faster. And this uh, gives us different different views of the same signal uh, but the, 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 the these are very typical and the others very 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 typical especially we want we want to be robust to noise is to add noise uh we can add noise uh background noise like recording in, in the street if we know that the system will be deployed in in, in quite challenging conditions but uh, typically we also do reverberation uh, convolution with reverberation signals essentially we imitate the fact that the signal has been recorded maybe in a church that is highly reverberated, mm. something like that. And, and then in spite, in addition to these uh, approaches that are very signal processing oriented, there are some others that are more um, more at the level of the or, or the networks themselves. For instance, we have we typically use something that we call a spec of men, that basically we take uh, this uh, time frequency representation of the signal, this spectrogram, and we delete just a column of time or delete a row of frequencies or we delete we remove a zero a block of of in the middle of the of, of this representation mm -hmm. of the signal and somehow this does a kind of regularization similar to uh, uh, drop out or something like that okay but there are ways of doing that yeah okay that's cool I can just add for that for disease detection um, so we have to be a bit more careful because it's not so, for example, for ASR, you know what you're looking for exactly, but for disease, something that's uh, clear, uh, where is the effect of the disease on the speech signal? Yeah. Um, the augmentation techniques um, have to be done with some care if you're not exactly sure what you're looking for, because you you, you may take the risk of interfering with the signal that you're uh, not with the noise part, the signal part. Yeah. I see. OK. so. Um, we also have some questions now from Anthony Gosler. Um, so again, thanks very much for your brilliant presentation. How do different languages affect the outcomes? Are they significant? So if, if, if we are talking, I don't know if we are talking about uh, diseases or ASR. I will answer first for ASR. Uh, most, most of the technology is actually um, language agnostic. Uh, meaning that the kind of pipeline and the systems we develop for Spanish or Portuguese or English are essentially the same. What changes what change actually is the data we use for it. 
And since we don't have the same amount of data for all the languages, this has a huge impact. Then there are some particularities, of course. We have languages that, that may be more challenging because they are tonal languages, like it uh, can be Chinese or something like that. We basically disregard tones for, for, for English or for Spanish or Portuguese. So there, there, there might be some specific particularities for some specific languages, but in general, the technology is quite language agnostic. And which, what really, really, really uh, makes the difference is the amount of data we have for training that. Essentially, we have a lot of data for English and not that much for, for most of the remaining languages. But, but then is it easy to transfer from, as the model is language agnostic, you, you could like kind of well, train on English yeah, okay. and then... Kind of, because most of the of, of the self-supervised models, basically, if you go to wav 2 back 2 uh, for instance, that is one of the kind, uh, kind of GPT models uh, transformers you can find. You can fine-tune uh, for different languages mm -hmm. uh, because some of them have been already trained with multilingual data. So essentially, if you there are versions of these models that uh, are multilingual, and quite easily, maybe with, a, I don't know, 10 hours of uh, supervised, da supervised data, you can fine tune to, the, to that specific language. So you, you, you can transfer between languages because these models have been trained with 16,000 hours of, of different languages of data. Okay, If you have a model that was trained with very few data, for instance, uh, of Spanish, it will be hard to, to, to transfer to others. But nowadays, with these deep learning representations, you can do this kind of, of transfers between, between yeah. languages. That's cool. So, yeah, no, I think it's more relevant for ASR, right? I guess it also probably depends on whether the languages are similar and share a lot of the phonemes or not so much, right? If you go to completely different um, ends. But, but for, for disease, so ideally it would all be language agnostic and it should work, uh, especially if you're looking for the acoustic cues, it should work regardless of the language. But then when you look at the cases, so you, in, it's usually not um, like 100% linear, uh, um, uh, easy to translate because languages will, for example, speak at different rhythms. So what means a long pause in one in one language will not be the same long pause in another language. Um, this is just to give an example. Uh, and because we're not yet using very, very large models trained on uh, a lot of data, so usually you need to define the, the features and get this more specific for each language. Although we were really interested um, on that topic and we'd really like to get some features that would be uh, working across different languages. That's cool. So Anthony still has um, some questions regarding the sampling efficiency of these models. So basically, how much data are we specifically talking about in order to train a, a model. Uh, I think you already gave some numbers. Well, there are many variables there, but uh, it, it, for, the first thing is if you train from the scratch, right? Because if, if mm -hmm. you use some sort of pre-trained model that can save uh, a considerable amount of time uh, to train. Uh, assuming that you can, uh, you have access to one of these pre-trained models that are on high in phase, and uh, that they are, they were partially using languages that were close to your target language. Uh, I would say that you can have a, a, a well, a, 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 give me a, a, a second uh, conditional here or a variable that it's, it depends of the target of the target uh, domain application. If you want to have good performance in red speech, probably it would be enough with like 10 hours of transcript data. You can have 100, way, way better, okay? But maybe if you start from something already pre-trained and you want only read the speech, 10, 10 hours can be uh, a reasonable number. Uh, if you turn from the scratch, you need way more. And if you want to go to more difficult uh, domains, like having spontaneous speech or, or or I don't know, noisy speech in the background, you will need more hours, okay? Then, but I don't know, if you want something, just a toy a toy system for ready speech, I would say that maybe you can do it, but it will depend a lot, okay? That's cool, thank you. And we also have a question from Gonzalo Govaya. Uh, who, and the question is, why are transformer-based models such as Whisper from OpenAI not the most suitable AI? ASR models for real-time speech to text. So essentially, uh, um, the thing. So there, there are 
there are different things. Okay, one thing is real time, another thing is streaming, right? Real time means that the uh, coding takes less time than the actual length of the signal. And it, depending on the state of the model, you can have real time with transformer models. That's not a problem. The problem is if you want to have ASR in a in a conversational system, you want to decode as long the client or the person is speaking. Okay. In and in transformer-based models that are based on self-attention, essentially you need the to compute the complete matrix of attention, what end to the beginning at the end of the sentence. Uh, of the sentence. So then you need the complete speech utterance. Of course, there are ways of uh, doing some constrained attention, and there are ways of solving that. But uh, but vanilla transformers, you need a complete sentence, and this will not work if we want to do it in the system, right? And and that makes that some other approaches, like CTC-based systems, or some others that I didn't mention that are called uh, are uh, RNN transducers, add still a lot of the interest of, for instance, Google or these kind of of uh, companies that want to have conversational systems working, right? I don't know if it, I made myself clear, but uh, um, th this is kind of uh, the problem. It can be fast, but you need a complete sentence. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, OK, I think it was uh, clear enough. I think that from our sh chat, we have all the questions answered. Then I think we can go to a final question, which will be mine <laughs> and a bit challenging. So. I'll ask two questions, one for each of you. So um, the one for Alberto is, where do you see the field going? Like, what are the problems that you think that in the future would be the most interesting to address? And Katarina, for you, um, like our performances, from what I can understand from the, the presentation, like the performances are around 70 to 80% uh, accuracy, right? Um, can we go beyond that? What is still missing there? Uh, so basically, the two questions are related into uh, are most, mostly related to future directions. Um, okay. Okay. So the, I think uh, this this question we should have prepared before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but the thing. Um, so um, the thing is, if someone have asked me. 10 years ago, uh, probably anyone, uh, even the people working in the field, that ASR would be as good as it is right now, I wouldn't mm -hmm. believe it. Okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm saying this to, 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 to make it clear that I, I, I'm probably very bad at making predictions. Okay. Uh, I, I, and to give you a, an example, I have a good friend of mine with whom I, I studied my masters and, and after and we are good friends and he bet me that one day in my lifetime he would make a phone call with a system and and he will fool me not knowing that it was an automatic mm -hmm. system yeah. okay? and i say something like not even to my grandchildren okay and nowadays i think it can happen tomorrow okay so <laughs> <laughs> i'm very, very bad at prediction but there, there, there are uh, here things that uh, we we know one of the things that is that uh, big companies are currently taking the, the lead of this field. So for us, for academics, uh, mm -hmm. it will be hard to, to make um, like real breakthroughs in very fundament fundamental yeah, models. But there are many problems that big company companies not care about yet. Like for instance, uh, maybe the disease and so on. And I think we have there the opportunity. The opportunity would be in how we can apply this uh, to problems that we have prob probably not even thought about. Okay, uh, but I, I don't want to do, make a prediction because I, I I I'm quite sure that ASR will continue improving and, and we will have extremely good systems in, in in the few next years. Okay. Okay, that's great. Thanks a lot, Katarina. Now yours. <laughs> yeah. So th this is harder harder than, than you imagine because. So although I did not report these results, there are many, many papers that are reporting very, very good accuracies in disease detection. Like you can even find some like 98%. But the big problem is because we're dealing with such small data, mm -hmm. um, it's also frequent that sometimes not the best practices are used, right? Okay. So for example, we're doing a lot of cross-validation, which makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense for small data. 
but we have to be careful to make sure that we're also not even overfeeding the test set, right? Because if mm -hmm. we have such small data and we're just finding for all the parameters, we can just massage the data enough to, to give to get such as we can get whatever we want, mm -hmm. and we cannot. And we have to be sure that what we're getting is is true, right? Either it's transferable or it has some meanings. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of results that, that reach very good performances if they can be 100% trusted in the sense that they could be transferable and actually meaningful, it's it's more of a question. So um, right now in the field, um, a lot of the researchers are, of course, using deep learning, but also taking a step back and looking at what what's the meaning that we're actually looking for. Okay. Look at just feed a wave um, sound directly into a very powerful neural network and probably get a good result. But um, we need to really be sure that we're just not um, confusing the data with some other, for example, record specific recording conditions of these uh, people with the disease. Um, also, mm. it's very small things. For example, imagine this case. We have a task that is pe uh, people to describe um, an image. So we, we present an image to, to the participants um, and they have to, to describe what they see. And just the way you present the task, it's very different. For example, if you have someone with a person and this person is describing and maybe they take a longer break and they will ask, what else do you see? The type of response will be completely different uh, than from if you don't have anyone encouraging, right? And if you have, for example, um, a different treatment for the disease subjects and the control subjects, you can already be introducing some small biases, mm -hmm. right? Yeah something to really take care uh, and pay attention uh, in this area. So yeah, but as soon as we get more data, these results are more are going to be more easily trusted. And of course, there's some statistic anal analysis we can run. Um, and there's also some discussion uh, on how these things are going. So yeah, I don't think for now, the very, very good results are super uh, easy to trust, although they exist. So we'll just have to get more data to wait and see what but it's okay. that's great thanks a lot thank so, you i think we are done let me just leave some final final notes to our audience so basically uh the recording of this uh presentation will be available on our youtube channel so feel free to review it as many times as you want and also we'll have the slides on our github uh we will also have in the description of our video uh, feedback form so feel, feel free to add some suggestions there let us know how what you think about the deep learning 101 uh, initiative if you have some some ideas of uh, applications that you'd like to to see addressed here we are open to to those recommendations and finally i want to thank everyone for attending to the to this presentation and in particular thank albert and katarina for this great hour so Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye -bye.